In the last few years, I've had the opportunity to interview some of the biggest names in the RV industry. Today, I am honored to share with you an interview with probably the most influential person in the high-end motor coach industry that I've had the opportunity to interview. Terry Lee is the co-founder of Country Coach and wife of the late Bob Lee RV legend. And today, Terry is gonna share with us some stories that have never been told before. So this is a video worth watching all the way to the end. And a huge thanks to Matt and Elena Carr and Terry Smith and the rest of the team at Oregon Motor Coach Center for making this interview possible. So you and Bob founded Country Coach? We founded Country Campers, which turned into Country Coach. We got married in 1961. And when did you and Bob get into the motorhome industry? In 1968, Bob moved with two other guys up to Oregon, and they got off at the freeway in Springfield and talked to a real estate broker, and they were looking for a building that they could afford because they wanted to start building campers. And they ended up in Junction City, Oregon. And they Sorry. rented a building, which is now right across the street from the Buy Mart on 6th Street. That's how it started in 1968. And in 1969, I moved up from Southern California with our daughter, who was then 18 months old. And they had started a company called Caribou Manufacturing. And they were making canopies and campers. And that lasted five years, and they sold the business. That was the deal that they'd worked five years and they put the company up for sale, which is what they did. And then Bob went to work for Kendall Ford in Eugene as their RV service manager. And then at nights, he rented a garage and started building canopies because he says, I think I can do this on my own. Any partners were there originally, or was it just the two of you? Um, there was a gentleman named Lowell Swartz, who was Bob's original partner, along with me. And then later, Bob's brother, Ron, came into the business, and we bought Lowell out. And then it was just the three of us. I think we started that company in 1972, or three, and then we incorporated the year after. And what was the first RV that Bob built? I think it was a chassis mount was our first motorhome. The people brought the chassis and we converted it. And we were over on Meadowview in what we called the little green building. Back in 1973, did you ever have any idea that Country Coach would end up becoming what it became? No, we were just trying to make a living. And by that time we had a second child, another daughter and Bob was doing something that he liked to do. In the peak of Country Coach, you had approximately 1,800 employees. How many employees were there when Country Coach started? When Country Campers started. I'm sorry, Country Campers, yes ma'am. Yeah. I think we had maybe 14. So how, how did it evolve? What was the next big step for the company to grow? Well, from Meadowview property that we were leasing, we moved into Eugene, into um, a building on Seneca and it was a tilt up slab building and gave us much more room and so we started building campers there and I can't remember how many people that we had we probably had 25 or so employees then we had started with a dealership and then Bob's brother Ron came into the business Okay, and so in, in 1984, the name was changed to Country Coach. What was happening around that time, and what caused the name to change to Country Coach? Because we were no longer building campers. We were building Class Cs and Class As, but we weren't building campers anymore, and we just felt that it better reflected the company and our growth. Absolutely. So when they were doing the motorhomes, it was all gas motorhomes, right? Yeah. Class C gas at one point, and Class A gas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then at one point we had to make the decision because I can't remember what year we started making our own chassis. Okay. And then yeah, we, that was we couldn't, we just didn't have room to build gas and diesel. So we made the decision that we would only build pusher diesels and, and do bus conversions. They were doing the Gilly chassis 
pre-bought just like Beaver was until they started putting slides in about 1997. Then they started building their own Dynamax chassis. Now you and Bob were known to be active RVers and use RVs. Whoa. Do you remember the first RV that you had? It was a slide-on camper on a pickup truck and it had a inside toilet <laughs> and shower, which was nice. And yeah. then from there we went to Class C's and we used to snowmobile in the wintertime all the time. And so that was wonderful because you'd have some place to put your wet clothes and we had two children that always went with us. And one year we went to West Yellowstone and it turned extremely cold that year and it was over Christmas and New Year's. We were parked in a small little RV park but it turned to be about 55 below with the wind chill. So we drained the oil from the coaches, the motors and stuff, and you keep your doors open inside on your cabinets and everything, and then you reheat the oil to put back in the engine, but we didn't have any trouble at all with our coaches. Wow, so... We're uh, here to attest that, <laughs> that they did work, you know, and then we, you just have to take precautions like anybody else. So you started with the truck camper. Uh, what are some of your favorite country coaches that you and Bob owned over the years? Oh, that's a hard one because they were all nice. I mean, as we evolved and, you know, made bigger coaches and it wasn't until the last few years that we started I call it running in a bus in a Prevo. D did you did you enjoy the Prevo country coaches? We did but they're meant for on the highway and we did a lot of highway driving back and forth Florida to Louisville to you know all kinds of places for the motorhome rallies and stuff. Being RVers and in the RV industry, what kind of RV trips did you usually take? Mostly for business and for motorhome rallies, FMCA. We did pre-rallies with the club. We only one time did we, that I recall, did we take just a vacation and we went to an RVIA meeting up in Wisconsin. And from there, we took off and met friends and went all the way to Maine. And then we came down through all of the eastern states and stuff, which we had never done before. And we actually took six weeks off of work. But we ended up in um, New Orleans for a motorhome rally. And were, were, is there any particular RV trips that stand out or any favorite memories that you have uh, all those years of RVing? Uh, let's see. It wasn't in a country coach, but we RV'd all through New Zealand. Oh, really? And we RV'd all through the Scandinavian countries. And we did a barge trip and with our RVs on the Tennessee River. How did those other coaches compare to country coaches? Small. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, country coaches are built on a different level over any other motor home out there. Bob Lee has really left a legacy in the industry and is known for quality and how he connected with the, the team that built these coaches. What, what was different about Bob and what, what's different that, that made country coach so different than any other motor home manufacturer out there? Well, I think Bob enjoyed using his own coaches. The idea was quality over quantity. We didn't manufacture a huge amount each year, but quality was one of the things in that. Something that he enjoyed doing when he would go to the RV rallies, especially for the country coach, is that to sit down with the people. And don't be afraid to ask questions because he got out there and RV'd right along beside him. And I think that was... Uh, contention of respect for him you know tell me if you had a problem I'll take it back to the shop you know I have those problems too you know because you have to stop and think the roads that we're driving these coaches on it's like driving your house down the road you know yeah well it really showed what was your first position with country coach when you started working in the early days Bob and I started the company together I did all of the office work. I did payroll, I did all the accounting, I answered phones, all of that kind of stuff, and Bob did all the purchasing and he was the person who built coaches and stuff. And it just evolved from there and I ran the office for a long time until 
at that time we didn't have computers and stuff. So when that came in and my stepfather moved up from California and he did all the purchasing, did that for 12 years. And then as we started more office people and everything, then gave up some of the accounting work and stuff. But I worked there for 20 years. And what was the first property that Country Coach was was at that you're working out of? Home. <laughs> so it started out of your home then? Yeah, we started out at the home. Wow. Yeah. Little Red Book bookkeeping system. That yeah. My accountant took me to the office supply store and said, this is what you're going to start keeping books in. But before that, I had worked at North American Aviation in the space division. And I worked in accounting and financial. So I kind of had an idea of, you know, but I had never done full cycle bookkeeping. And at that point, when you started in your home, did you ever have any idea that Country Coach would become one of the largest motorhome manufacturing facilities in the world? Didn't have a clue. <laughs> All we were just trying to do was to make a living and support our families. And Bob was doing something that he really enjoyed doing. He was always a go-to person. For Bob, the glass was always half full, and he wasn't afraid to try anything. Yeah, what? Um, yeah, t- tell us more about Bob too. Like, what type of a of a person was Bob? What are, What do you think Bob would want to be remembered as, re- remembered for? Hmm. Gosh, there's so many things. I just think being a good person and always doing the things that he loved and being kind to other people. And he was a good family man. He was a good husband, a good father. He loved the outdoors. He grew up hunting and fishing with his family. He was raised on a dairy farm. He had good work ethics. I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of former Country Coach employees, and I hear over and over people sing praise to Bob Lee and how he worked alongside of them. How did he interact with the employees at Country Coach? Well, he liked most of the people, all of the people that worked for him and everything, and he would get down there and whatever he needed to do to help, especially after hours and stuff. And I think one of his models was he wouldn't ask you to do anything he wouldn't do himself. That was whether sweeping up floors or cleaning the toilets or whatever. I mean, we've all done it all. And so he would get down there and just, I mean, I think that the guys respected him for that. And so as the company grew, there a moment where you realize like this has really become something great? I think when we bought the property across the street from our original building and started building the new buildings and everything is that you realize then, wow, we're really growing because we've outgrown this other building and we've added on to it twice. So now we need more land. So when we bought the 40 some acres across the street and some of the people would remember there used to be a little pink house and the gentleman that owned all that property, we told him that he could live there until he died, that we'd take care of the house and everything, which he did. Eventually the house was sold and it was moved. Are there any other memories, you know, of all the years of Country Coach? What are some of your favorite memories of all the years of manufacturing motorhomes? Well, I don't know. I think some of my best memories are going to Country Coach club rallies and all the people that we met. And not too long ago I thought to myself, most of our close friends were all RVers and they were all in our RV clubs and stuff and just there's so many wonderful people out there that RV and I think those were some of my fondest memories and taking our kids with us and stuff. Yeah absolutely. So at one point Country Coach manufactured fifth wheels or trailers? We didn't do fifth wheels but we did trailers, towables and park models. And how long, uh, how long was that? We did that for a couple of years. That was when there was kind of a downturn in the economy and stuff. And so we were doing that. And we also had a fabricating shop that we built wood stoves, inserts and stuff. It was the early 80s or? Mm -hmm. And what caused you to get away from all of that and, and switch with just the motorize and then eventually go? Well, then the economy picked up. And so we didn't have to do all of that and stuff, so that's when we decided we couldn't do both. We didn't have the space. And then going to strictly diesel motorhomes, 
and no more gas motor homes. Was there a reason for that, or do you remember making that decision? It was just, what could we do best? And we felt like we actually built good diesel pusher motor homes. And space, again, was a problem. And so we just made the decision that we wouldn't do any more gas vehicles. And that's when we stopped making Class Cs. And do you remember when you started converting Prevo buses, what caused you to start converting the Prevo buses sometime in the late 80s, I believe? Someone brought us a coach, and I think it was, I don't know if it was Magic Carpet, which was in Eugene. There was another gentleman that worked for a cabinet shop that wasn't part of that, but he knew someone that had a bus shell and wanted to convert it. And so that's what we did was, that's how we started was we converted that coach. I think we did a used Bluebird where somebody brought us a Bluebird coach and then I want to say MCIs. Yeah, MCI buses, yeah. MCIs. Yeah. So there's a country coach on an MCI chassis somewhere? There's a couple of them that we did, but the people brought them to us. We didn't buy them outright and then we converted them into motorhomes. And a few Eagles, you did some Eagles. There's a yeah, guy who's been coming here with a all original pristine Eagle coach and it is beautiful out of the 80s. I'd like to see that. I, I want to get a phone call next time that coach comes I'll around. I'll connect you with that guy. Okay, I appreciate yeah, he's it. He's looking to sell I it. I forgot he's, about that. We did do a couple of yeah. Eagles. Yeah. yeah, he's been here twice at Oregon Motor Club Center. Okay, well that's another story we're going to have to I'll, dig up. I'll get you connected with him. I appreciate that, he's, Terry. He's looking to sell. He's at that age. All right, well we'll, uh, we'll find him a buyer. So, now your motor homes that you you and Bob owned, did you get to just use any country coach? Uh, did you buy your own motorhomes or how did that all work? So we bought our own motorhomes. That was a decision that the boys made is that they would buy their own motorhomes, use them for a year and then take them to, to the rallies and that kind of stuff. So we could be with the people. And then after a year, we would put them up for sale. And then the next model coming down the line that we wanted to try we would buy another coach and so we did that for years and are there any specific models that you remember that you liked probably the affinities uh-huh and the magnus and did you ever own a country coach on a prevo yes we owned several of those yeah, okay from an rver standpoint uh, is there any advice that you would have for RVers? What's your best advice for, for RVers or someone that's thinking about RVing? I think it's a wonderful way of life. The other side of it is, is that you need to remember that you're on the highways, driving down different kinds of roads and stuff like that, and you need to take care of them and to remember how important the tires are. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We liked our being so, I mean, I liked having all my own stuff, and we had, well, Terry's got it now, but we had a big motorhome garage, and, and, yeah, it's full of and we never parts. went into, I'll tell you how Bob was, because he was very particular. We never went into a show or a campground that we didn't pre-wash the coach, and he would make them hand-wash the coach, because he always had special paint jobs on them. And then we would get out of the coach and we would wipe it all down before we would go into shows or before we'd go into the rallies. I like, I'm a detail guy, so I respect that. That's what something that people forget, sorry. Well, that when you're an RV manufacturer, you're never actually out of the RV business. You sell your coaches to a dealer. The dealer wants to floor those coaches. The bank or the flooring company makes the manufacturer sign a buyback that if within six months or nine months they don't sell those coaches, if they don't move, then the manufacturer has to buy the coaches back. So you're never off the hook until that coach is actually sold. That's a very good point. Manufacturing isn't for the faint of heart, so. No. Okay, now that's, that's what took out a lot of the RV manufacturers. Some of the RV manufacturers didn't have that arrangement. So when a dealer took possession of the coach, that was a dealer's coach, and the manufacturer wasn't responsible for it. Well, when the crash of 08 happened, the ones that had the agreement where the manufacturer was still on the hook till the dealer sold it, when all of a sudden the economy overnight collapsed, 
Now, the dealer is not responsible for the coats the manufacturer is, and that's why some of the great companies out there went down the way they did, is the ones that survived, a lot of them did not have that kind of an agreement. So it was the dealers that went down, and they didn't take the manufacturers with them. And you'd have to find some place to sell the coaches because, of course, you weren't a dealer yourself. Yeah, you can. Yeah. And you had contracts with other dealers. That you can't that sell them. You're not going to sell those coaches. Yeah, yet. I had the banks calling me to buy brand new coaches for half of the price. And, uh, uh, of course, you couldn't so sell they, them so for they could unload them. full price, but I would buy them for half price and then sell them, buy them for 50 cents on the dollar, sell them for 60 cents. Everybody so still the manufacturers yeah. out there being the fat hog. Yeah. Yeah. He's on the hook. Yes. Until that coach, and then he's still on the hook for a year's worth of warranty. Yep. Or whatever. Terry, I really appreciate you taking the time to share with myself and the folks on YouTube some incredible stories. Greatly appreciate all that you and Bob have done for the RV industry. And I also greatly appreciate all of you out there on YouTube subscribing to the channel and liking these videos. I hope you're all having a great day. Thanks again. Thanks. It's been really nice meeting you. Likewise.